There's no jubilation. There's no happiness here because there are only losers in this case. The Doyle family have lost. We have lost our lives in prison and for 20 years, justice has been lost. Welcome to the Extraordinary Stories podcast. Hello and welcome, it's me Barry Henderson, Uh, thank you if you are a returning listener and welcome if you are new. So we're on episode 8 at the moment, Uh, the love for episode 7, the Tracy Andrews case was really nice, so thank you to everyone who got in touch about that particular episode. Um, I want to say, I want to start by saying thanks to those who've shouted me out on Twitter, Really lovely to get a shout out from Once Upon a Crime podcast, which I've been listening to for a couple of years now, and I, yeah, that's a great podcast. So well researched and just told in such a lovely way. Uh, I'd like to say hello to podcasts we listen to on Facebook. That's a really excellent group to join as well. People are really willing to help you out if you're new to podcasting and need a hand. Um, at the end of the podcast, I'll I'll give you the info of how to get in touch with me. Um, it would be really lovely to hear from you. Hello to Alex K in Australia for all your lovely comments on Twitter. They are really appreciated. And a big thanks to all the Instagram followers this week too. I've had a real surge in followers. So it's nice to see the podcast is getting some love. I received an email actually from, uh, what's her name? Gemma Grancher. So hi Gemma. Um, she's asking if, well, she was asking me if I would talk to her about an article that she's writing on how podcasts are researched and the research and recording process. And then she asked me a question which made me laugh. She said, are you planning to release more than one episode a week? Now, that is tricky and I would love to be in a position where I could be releasing more than one in a week but at the moment, work-wise, that's quite difficult. But I am planning on trying to maybe, maybe put out a little mini, mini episode that might just be sort of 10, 15 minutes long in the middle of the week where I can just share short, shorter stories, shorter, just sort of more, yeah, smaller, weak and a briefer stories. So uh, thanks, for, thanks, thanks for that question, Gemma. I am, I am really working on it. I guess that that got me to thinking, actually, what, well, it made me sort of think, people listening, what are the stories you think are worth sharing? Now, I can do all the research in the world, but people out there listening, you must have some crazy stories to tell, either about yourself, your friends, your family, things that are local to you, things which just blow your mind. Well, send me them. Send me anything send me a link send me a few words i'd really like to hear from you um it's extraordinary stories podcast at gmail.com is how you would do that yeah get in touch let me know let me know a story that either you would like me to cover or a story that you just think is extraordinary just a bit weird a bit mental get in touch and just let me know okay that aside let's get to this week's story This is one that I've wanted to do from the very beginning, but it's a story that I wanted to just get it right, and in order to do that, I had to read an awful lot, and I had to watch an awful lot, so I just wanted to make sure I had all my ducks in a row, or whatever that phrase is, I had all my facts lined up correctly, so I finally got there with it, and the story this week is the story of the Glasgow Ice Cream Wars. Now that's a light-hearted title, but there is very little that's light-hearted about this story. Obviously every true crime story is upsetting, and we'll all be affected by different stories in different ways. It may be that you hear one and it breezes over you and you don't have much connection with it. And it may be that 
you hear one and it absolutely hits a chord with you. I'm not saying this one absolutely strikes me to my core because anything like this has ever happened to me, but I think because it's Glasgow based and I remember I remember this happening, although I was very young, I remember it in the press and I remember it being talked about. I think that's why I felt like I wanted to get it right and there are some quite upsetting parts to this story. The Glasgow Ice Cream Wars was a turf war in the east end of Glasgow in the 1980s. It was between rival criminal organisations selling drugs, stolen goods from ice cream vans. Van owners were often involved in frequent violence and intimidation tactics. So this is a story of intimidation, murder and an absolutely shocking 20 year court battle. So we start in the 1980s in Glasgow, Scotland, in the east end of the city. Traditionally, the east not as wealthy as the west or the south at that time, which uh, were developing quite nicely. The east end of Glasgow has a history. The east was, in those days, a fairly run-down and a fairly poor place. Not so much now. Not at all now, in fact. It's a really developing place. It's lovely. It's got a really up-and-coming feel about it. I'm probably about 40 minutes away from the east of the city, where I am. I do a lot of work in schools, and sometimes I work in those areas. And I absolutely love going into the schools in the east. They're just... Some of the people that you meet out there, they're just the some of the best Glaswegian people that you can actually meet. At the time of this story, this wasn't a very well-developed area, but it, it really is now. So for those who've never visited Glasgow, what are Glaswegians typically described like? Thick-skinned, robust, like a laugh, like a drink. I mean, that's certainly very true. Hardy people, and people who are caring will help you out and good to their fellow man. So some of that's true. In fact, all of that is true. But like any city, it does have its problems. There's, there is the same amount of dicks in Glasgow as there are good people. And I love Glasgow as a city, but it can be violent, it can be dangerous, and it can be a very unsafe place. It can also just be beautiful. Some of the buildings in Glasgow are some of the most stunning architecture that you'll see. The parks are stunning, and there are good people. But, you know, as a city, it's just like anywhere else. It's got its good, it's got its bad. As a city, one of the things that I always think is great about Glasgow, what makes it consistently brilliant, is you get this sort of worlds colliding thing that happens. You can be walking down one of the poshest streets in Glasgow with really high-end shops, fancy restaurants, designer stores, all that sort of stuff. You turn one corner and you're sometimes in Glasgow's dodgiest streets, which I kind of love. I think that's I think that's a good thing in a city where you quite never quite know when you turn a corner what it is that you're actually going to get. So let's go back to the 1970s and 80s. A large part of Glasgow's housing was the tenements at that time. So blocks of flats where up to 20 families could live at a time. But these were very overcrowded. And an entire family of parents, kids, grandparents would be squashed into just a couple of rooms. So in the 80s, something called the schemes were built. The schemes were built to be a new place to live. They were supposed to be safer. They were away from crime and they were away from the overcrowding because they had more space. It's basically just a lot of flats crammed together but with more rooms in them and taken out of the busier parts of the city. I think in America you call them the projects. I think that's the word that they use to describe them. But every city has these um, types of things. They just happen to be called the schemes in Glasgow. So they these were built at a rough time in the city. Glasgow had the reputation of being the murder capital of the west of Europe. Hmm, lovely. Now the city was obviously concerned with shedding this nickname as soon as possible and 
redoing tenement housing and building schemes was a part of that solution. However, the schemes had little or no facilities. They had town planners when they built these buildings hadn't thought to include shops in their plans. So, with no shops around, ice cream van businesses sprung up everywhere to fill that niche. The ice cream vans or ice cream trucks would sell the obvious ice cream, (laughs) but they'd also sell other things. They'd sell groceries, they'd sell household items. In the 1980s, if you were a van owner, you could make up to £200 a week profit. Quite a lot of money for that time. But only, and this is where it's really important, only if your patch was your own and another ice cream van didn't try to sell in your area. Now this is where the turf war begins. Ice cream vans sold all sorts of things as well as confectionery. They would sell drugs, they sold alcohol, Um, kind of you name it, you could buy it. The guy who was selling ice cream in my area, I I didn't live in the area that we're talking about here, but every area I think had its own ice cream van. The guy who used to come round and sell the ice cream was, uh, he had his van taken away from him by police because it turned out that as well as ice cream, He was selling porn, so he used to sell porn magazines and porn videos. Uh, So that was a little side business that he was running. (laughs) So he was, yeah, letting people come to his van, get a wee video and take it home. So that was quickly shut down by police. Vans were brought into areas sometimes where there was already an ice cream van in operation. Now, this just caused conflict straight away. And what would happen is these vans would start to follow each other and they would do things like stop right next to each other when one had stopped and they would compete for business. They would sell things that the other van was selling, but at 50% of the price. And van smashings began to happen at this time. So vans would be attacked. So if you were in your patch and another van dared to enter into your patch, a van smasher would come along and the sorts of things that they would do is they'd smash your windows in, slash your tyres, or they would graffiti your van with swear words. These were called frighteners. So sometimes this worked. Vans would be put out of operation for a few weeks while it was being repaired. And sometimes it was enough to actually frighten off the competition. That van whose tyres you'd slashed would probably never come back. A female van driver describes how she sat at the wheel of her van as four men smashed it up with baseball bats as she sat there covering her face. Fucking hell. So it's a pretty rough time. Now, this was in the press at the time and the police did their very best to keep an eye on it. Let's introduce into this story the very first character we need to know about. So, Andrew Doyle, or his nickname, Fat Boy. And that's a charming nickname for anyone. Andrew Doyle, Fat Boy, uh, was in charge of driving an ice cream van in the East End of Glasgow, and he would drive the van and a teenage schoolgirl would sell the products. Now, he was approached by a gang of local drug dealers who asked him to sell drugs for them on his route, and he refused. And this seriously pissed them off. It pissed them off that he said no to selling drugs. The police at the time said, Fat Boy, that's actually... I watched an interview and the the police officer actually refers to him as Fat Boy. Fat Boy was a pretty good guy that kept out of trouble and he refused to be intimidated. But there was a bigger war happening. Van drivers who got into each other's patches were warned through frighteners not to do it again. So total intimidation tactics. A way to send a warning to your target that you were not happy. 
So be that smash up their van, be that slash their tires, you were sending a message, a very clear message, I am not happy that you are in my patch. And the frighteners against Andrew Doyle, fat boy, were to do with the fact that actually he refused to sell drugs on his route. So things took a bit of a bad turn for Andrew Doyle at this point. One night a man in a balaclava with a son-off shotgun appears in front of the ice cream van that Doyle is driving, points it at the driver's window and takes aim. He fired four shots at the window where Andrew Doyle sits in horror watching this happen. Luckily he manages to get out through the back of the van. But this was only the start of the horror for Andrew Doyle. On April 16th, in the early hours of the morning, the next frightener took place. Andrew Doyle lived with his parents in their three bedroom flat. This was on the top floor of a block of flats. Inside, there were six members of the Doyle family. James Doyle, age 53, his daughter, Christina, age 25, and her 18 month year old son, Mark. James Doyle's three sons were there as well. James, 23, Andrew Doyle, fat boy, 18 years old, and Tony, 14. So, what was the frightener? The front door of the flat, with all six inside, is lit on fire. The fire burns into the flat. The family inside realise there is a fire but they have no way to escape. They run to the windows and they start screaming for help. A man who lives downstairs runs up and he tries to get through the burning door but the flames are just so fierce he can't get close enough. The horror is that no one can get into the flat because the door is where the fire has started. The windows then smash out and those inside are screaming at the, down to those in the street asking for help. Everyone in that whole building is now out in the street or they're at the front door and they're trying to help. The fire brigade arrives, three trucks pull up, the firefighters get into the flat and they pull the bodies out of the fire. People watching see the family members be brought out of that fire with their skin so badly burned that it has turned black. Alive inside the flat. Barry, this is the point where you're going to start the last two sentences of that again. These are the ones that you're going to want. Discard everything else up to that point. People watching see the family members be brought out of the fire with their skin so badly burned it has turned black. The only person alive inside is Andrew Doyle. He's taken immediately to the hospital but his burns are so severe that he dies the next day. So there was national shock. The Scottish press, the UK press, they took this story and they ran with it. This was huge. The police went into action immediately. 50 police officers were put onto this case. 1,500 people were interviewed and 4,000 statements were recorded. Because of the fact it was the Doyle family, there was no doubt this was related to the ice cream wars. So the next and vital character that we need to meet is William Love. In Barlinny Prison, which is a Scottish prison, there was an inmate named William Love. Now, William Love, probably, I would say, probably I'd say known as Wally. In, in Scotland, William often becomes Wally. I know in other countries it might be Willie, but... 
well, that's a name for <laughs> something else here, um, a commonly used word for a man's penis. But well, actually, it could have been Billy. Maybe it's Billy. Um, anyway, so we'll call him Mr. We'll call him Mr. Love from now on. Mr. Love tells police that he had been part of a campaign against Andrew Doyle, Andrew Fatboy Doyle. A campaign to frighten Andrew Doyle into selling drugs on his van when he said he didn't want to do it. He said, I was a part of that campaign. He said the following information. He had been paid by a man called Thomas Campbell. Thomas Campbell goes by TC. Now that's for ease, that's what I'll call Thomas Campbell from now on. And he said... He had heard a conversation in a pub where TC was there and the fire plan was put into place. He heard TC say, let's set fire to the door of that flat and we'll frighten fat boy. So, police get this information from inside prison. Mr. Love is, at this point, inside berlin on an armed robbery charge and he decides to talk to police. Why? Why? Why does he decide to help the police? Now, he himself has said, yeah, I was a part of that Frighteners group. I was a part of that intimidation. So why the fuck is he helping police? I'm sure we all know why. It was an order to have a lesser sentence for the armed robbery that he was in for. So he knew exactly what he was doing at this point. Prisoners, when you're in prison, you've only got information to trade on. You don't have an awful lot else that's going to get you an early release. So he is released. And in the underworld and in that world where people know what's going on, They understand straight away this is a deal. They're saying he has lied. This information is completely false. Okay, so, so far we have Andrew Doyle and his family dead. We have Mr. Love, a known frightener, uh, who's naming a guy called TC to the police. The next character to introduce, also vital to the story, is a man called Joseph Granger. He was a known criminal who police visited often. They asked, what What did he know about this? What did he know about this fire? He says the exact same thing as Mr Love. He too heard that conversation in the pub. He too heard the fire plan. So now that's two witnesses. But he adds something that's even more vital. This It's so explosive to this story and to this case. He says, I was there the night of the fire. He says it goes like this. His job, this is Mr Granger, is to keep edgy. Now... If you if you don't know what keep edgy means, it's um I don't know if it is just local to to Glasgow. It, it it's a phrase that I've known since I yeah since I was really young. Keep edgy is basically the person who keeps the lookout, the person who watches while another group of people do something that they shouldn't be doing. You're the one who's looking out for either the police or you're looking out for somebody coming or a witness um, I don't think I've actually until I've started researching this I don't think I've heard keep edgy um, since I was about 15 so that, that was nice to bring that back into my brain so his job Granger was to stand outside make sure that no one would come and he says that TC who we've already named and another man called Steel that they go up to the door of the flat, they douse it in petrol, and they light it on fire. Now, odd that he would offer up this information 
I mean, more odd that he's actually saying, I was a part of it, I was there. But Mr. Granger also had some criminal activity hanging over him, and all of a sudden, that just disappears. So we've got Mr. Love, we've got Mr. Granger, both of whom in massive trouble with the police. They give these statements, and all of their troubles disappear. So in the frame for this, for the death of six people, we have TC and we have Steele. So TC and Steele are arrested. Police burst into TC's house. They start ransacking the place and his wife's there. They're both in bed. She starts screaming the place down. Not a clue what's going on. So this detail comes to light. The police officers who arrest him said that when TC was being taken to the police station, he offered them this information. I only wanted to smash his windows in. The fire at Doyle's was only ever meant to be a bit of a frightener. It just went too far. Now, it's this, this has became very controversial because the police officers who arrested him said that he absolutely definitely said these words. He says, fucking bullshit, and never said anything like that. But it ends up being used against him in court and it becomes a situation where it's him versus the police. It's his word against theirs. And they say, he said, I only wanted the windows smashed in. The fire was only meant to be a frightener. And it just went too far. But everyone around TC says, this is absolute bollocks. He would never have said these words. The next piece of evidence that they have against TC is a photocopy of a map of the area in which the flat was and there is a circle around the Doyle flat where the fire took place. I mean literally X marks the spot. So again that's controversial because people will say TC is a man who throughout his life he had been involved with the police a lot of times. Would he be stupid enough to photocopy a map, circle it, kill six people, and then actually just leave that evidence lying about his flat. So next, Joseph Steele is arrested, and in the back of the police car, he supposedly says eight words which would become the basis for his murder charge. He says, I'm not the one who lit the map. And these words become absolutely crucial to the court case. What he actually says, if I just translate into Glaswegian, he says, he says, I'm not the one that lit the match. I'm saying that only because when I looked back over this story, what I realised is a lot of <laughs> a lot of the press at the time, a lot of the Scottish press actually put that verbatim as him saying, I'm no the one that lit the match. But when that was translated into somewhere else, it was, I'm not the one who lit the match. Okay, it's the same words, but yeah, there's an interesting play there <laughs> in vernacular. So the argument is that actually, no, he never said that in the back of the police car. No, he never said those words. However, every police officer who was in that car remembers him saying those eight words. Again, it's him versus the police. So we've now got a situation where two guys have been arrested and they're supposed to, somewhere between being arrested and getting to the police station, have said these very incriminating statements. And they're against the police when it comes to court. So the trial begins and it gets really messy. The star witness, Mr. Granger, who, if you'll remember, is the man who said, I'm keeping edgy. He was the lookout. He gets on the stand and he says he never told police any of that information. It's all been invented by the police. It's entirely been invented to make sure that somebody goes to prison for those six deaths. He says he wasn't at the scene of the murder. He wasn't the lookout. 
So, fuck, this starts to get weird at this point. Because he is the star witness. He is literally saying, I was there. I saw these two men do it. And he gets up in court and changes his story entirely. Now, the only reason that Steele and TC are ever charged is because of these statements. So this is huge. This becomes very problematic for the legal system. But he has a signed statement and he says, police bullied me into it. They said to him, if you don't sign this, we'll pin this on you. We'll say that you're the guy that lit the fire. And in court, he actually says, and this is quote, I swear on my mother's life, I had fuck all to do with that fire. I like swear on your life. It's a it's a big thing. It's a big. I feel it's a big statement to make when you say, I swear on my life. Sometimes it's the end of an argument with someone, I think, when you're... Yeah, when there's dishonesty there, when you when you can say to someone, no, I swear on your life, or I swear on my life, sometimes that's just, that's just enough. It's just enough to end it. But everything at this point is entirely thrown into a spin with the case. So the story starts to change in court. No, TC wasn't actually at the fire. He was at home, but he did plan it. He planned it, but he got someone else to do it. So it keeps going back and forth. And there's this, did you hear a conversation in the pub? Well, Mr. Love from earlier on is is still saying, yeah, 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 he did. He definitely heard the fire plot happening in, in the pub. The judge at this point steps in because the case is becoming so complicated and so messy. And you have to remember, this is being watched by everyone at the time. Now, we're pre, we're in the 1980s, so we're not quite at the level of, you know, people being able to watch court TV or watch that sort of stuff. But the press is all over this case and it was such a huge talking point in Glasgow because, well, because of the absolute brutality of six deaths. But the question hanging over it was, are the are the right guys being tried for this? What is this complicated web of people? Are we actually trying the right people for the for these murders? So the judge says to the jury, I'm going to make this really clear for you. If you believe that Mr. Love heard this conversation in a pub then you have to, you absolutely have to find these men guilty. But, if you think Mr. Love has lied, there can be no conviction here. So it's turned over to the jury, and for two weeks, they deliberated. They come back, they return the verdict, and it's guilty. TC and Steele are both given life in prison. What had convinced the jury? No one could understand. Steele and TC continued to claim that they were innocent of these murders. TC was interviewed in prison and he spoke at length about his childhood and the fights that he would get into and the gangs that he ran around in but he said that that changed when he got a bit older when he got married and when he had kids he settled down but he says police refused to believe that they thought he was caught up in way more way more criminal activity and that this was just a chance to pin something on him and get him in prison. So a set up to get a man in prison that they had always hated. So had the right people in the ice cream war murders been put in prison? The general thoughts were very confused. Some said yes, some said no. I have a memory, I would have been about 11, maybe, no, would have been, yeah, about 11 or 12 when this happened, and I remember being at my grand's house, and this topic, it was so big, 
people were really passionate about this story. My parents, my aunts, my uncles, they would get into huge arguments over yes those two guys did it or no they didn't or some thought it was a massive police fuck up and that actually this was just all we were we were watching a massive miscarriage of justice unfolding in her eyes other people felt sure that actually these two guys were guilty then something comes to light there is an absolutely glaring error and it's a really fucking obvious one Mr. Love says that the conversation he heard in the pub, the one that got them convicted, happened on March the 23rd, which was a Friday. However, he'd also committed armed robbery two days before and was in hiding from the police. He had an alibi for that Friday and that alibi did not involve being in a pub. So he had two very different stories about where he was on that day and only one of those stories can be true so when this happens TC and Steele decide they want an appeal the appeal happens but the convictions are upheld and at this point we find out the following that the gunshots fired do you remember me talking earlier on about Mr Doyle sitting in his ice cream van and someone appears with a son off shotgun and they fired at his window, that was actually Mr. Love that had done that. Not a random character from anywhere else, but an actual central character to this story. Why that came out in court in the appeal and not beforehand, I I don't really understand. People knew Mr. Love was a frightener and they knew that he had done a lot of a lot of bad things to a lot of ice cream vans at the time. But these people were never invited into court. And it's not clear why. So now, TC and Steele, they're still in jail. Where is Mr Love? The man who put them there. He's living in a houseboat on the Thames in London. This is years later. So we're talking... I think at this point, 10 years down the line. These guys have been in for 10 years. Now he's tracked down by Channel 4 in the UK. And he gives an interview. And he is brutally honest about his role in all of this. He says, yeah I did. I shot at Doyle in his van. He says, and this is big. He says to a TV reporter, Yeah, it was all fabricated information. I never heard a conversation in a pub. The interviewer says, But where did it come from? He says, You tell me. So it was reported at this point it was a deal. I mean, of course it was a fucking deal. Of course it was a deal. Police told him, We'll set you free from your armed robbery charge if you stand up in court and you lie. You stand up and you point the finger at these two men. You say that they went to that house that night and they set that fire. You're a free man. So now, now we know. Now we know. Now the facts are out there. Okay? These two guys are in prison based on a false statement. The guy who put them there actually says these words to camera in a documentary. So it gets worse now when Mr Granger, who was the guy who was on the lookout, says police told him, you will be charged with the death of these six people if you don't sign a statement that says it was TC and it was Steele who started the fire that night. So he did and he was terrified. He was terrified to withdraw the statement. He was terrified to sign it. He's got nowhere to go at this point. He is totally trapped. Now, this is a mess when all of this information comes to light. For a police system who pride itself on being the best, and I'm going to say, yeah, I do think the Scottish police system is great. I think the Scottish justice system is really good. And we're talking, you know, obviously a good few years ago. This is the 80s, but what a fuck-up at the time. Inside prison, TC had gone on a hunger strike 
and had remained in solitary confinement without eating for 97 days. He says, I didn't want to die, but I expected to die. During that time, he only consumed black tea, but police took this away from him. He was 10 days uh, into having no fluid and having nearly n- having not eaten for nearly 100 days. Fucking hell, I can't go three years without eating. Um, and they took everything else away from him. They took his paper, his pen. They left him with nothing in his cell. It was at this time that 16 prison guards came into his cell and they attacked him brutally with truncheons and weapons. So his face, his body, his testicles were beaten brutally. Now the guards told two different stories to excuse what had happened here, but TC from inside prison took these guards to court and he won compensation. Mr. Steele escaped prison three times. Three times, that's pretty fucking good. Um, And would do things like chain himself or superglue himself to public buildings. He actually superglues himself to uh, Buckingham Palace, which is which is pretty good. I mean, it's mental, but it's good. And if you've if you're in prison and you believe entirely you're in there and you have not committed the crime that you are being punished for, then yeah, okay, get yourself out of there if you can and superglue yourself to a building. What a fucking statement to make. I mean, he wanted to make a large noise and he wanted to get noticed. So now, massive doubts are setting in for everyone. And I suppose they always were. But now, in the event that both of the guys who made the statements that put the other two in prison have come forward and said, yeah, they're not true. This is, yeah, a huge mess. And it's getting lots and lots and lots of press and those handling the case are coming under a lot of scrutiny. In my grand's house, this was even more on fire at this point. This this was even more of a talking point. So now that all of the conflicting information is brought out into the light. But there's an, there is a bit of an issue here and I don't know if this is the same in the rest of the world I don't even know if it's the same in Scotland now, but apparently police can decide what information they give or they don't give to the prosecution and the defence when it comes to going to court. When I know that there's millions of cases where in the world someone has gone to prison, been wrongfully convicted, and it's come to light that police just didn't give that information. But I think the difference is, I think it's actually okay over here for police to say no we're not going to give them that bit of information in order to prosecute that person or in order to possibly get that person off i'm not really an expert in that and i've tried to do some research but i'm not sure that i quite found the answer if anyone is an expert out there then you know get in touch let me know i I actually genuinely would like would like to know the answer to that because it yeah, it's, I don't think it's a case of full disclosure. I don't think you have to hand over everything. So, just to complicate this, don't worry. This And this story has got lots of turns and twists and things happening, but we're, we're, nearing, the, we're nearing the end now. Mr Granger is arrested for perjury, for standing up and lying. Now, the irony being he's arrested for standing up in court and lying, and it's the police that put him up to lying. So that's just completely fucked up. But he's put into prison with TC and Steele. So in one jail, you have the man who sent these two innocent guys to prison. And the two innocent guys who are there because he fucking lied. I mean, that is a nightmare. So 12 years into this whole entire mess, it goes to court again. The case is re-examined and both men are set free. Shortly after this, three judges come together and they decide that they are going to really look over the whole entire case once more. This is just crazy. TC and Steele are put back in prison. 
these three judges decide actually they are guilty. Yeah, we've we've relooked at the evidence, and they are guilty. <sighs> so, in two thousand and four, for the third time, the case goes to court. This time not in Glasgow but in Edinburgh, and the judge makes a final decision, and this is the once and for all decision. He says there is not enough evidence to keep these men in prison. Let them go. And they're free. And that is where the story ends. A subdued Mr Campbell coming out of court says there's no jubilation here. There's no cause for happiness because there's only losers in this case. The Doyle family have lost. We've lost their lives in prison. And for 20 years, the justice system has been lost. Mr Steele said, I'm just glad to get it over with. I'm just happy that I'm going home. It's been a hard fight, but that's it now. So lawyers for the two men are now seeking compensation and there is calls for a public inquiry. And so ends the story of the Glasgow Ice Cream Wars. Okay, as always, what do I like about this story? Well, I mean, I just like... I like the fact... I like the mess of it. I like the fact that police lied. Two innocent men went to prison. Just the utter miscarriage of justice or... Yeah, just the absolute mess of it. It's, it baffles me. It just totally baffles me. Obviously, it's also close to me, this story, because geographically, it's close to me. And also, I have young memories of living through this story. Um, but yeah, but I'm really glad that these guys are free now. I'm glad that they're out. And maybe, maybe we will never know who it was that actually went up to that house and lit that fire. But... I'm glad that two men who didn't actually do it, or who who we can't prove did it, aren't rotting in jail for something that you can't prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay, I really hope you enjoyed that. So, it would be lovely if you wanted to get in touch. Um, so, if you want to get in touch on Twitter, it's at Extra Stories Pod. If you want to get on touch in touch. On Instagram or Facebook, it's Extraordinary Stories Podcast. If you want to send me an email, it's Extraordinary Stories Podcast at gmail.com. It would be lovely to hear from you. And you could possibly, if you have a second out there, and you could possibly go and give me an iTunes review, that would be amazing. I'm trying hard here with these podcasts, and apparently the iTunes review. Let people let people know about the podcast. I'd like I'd like to get more people listening. I'd like to get more people out there. Um, yeah, okay. If you've got time, get in touch. As I always say, if you know a story that's worth sharing, please let me know. Okay. Goodbye. It didn't. It didn't affect me really one way or the other. <laughs> I would imagine from the look on his face Let's get it on, let's do it, let's get it over
Let's get it on. Let's do it. Let's get it over.